Go into your room. That's right. Sit on that fat of yours and do nothing but listen to records. So like we're searching buyers by working with the ambient technology and the sound is able to output 10 channels, so 5.4 channels. So um, actually working with the ambient technology, working with the uh, drivers and the sound is also co-working with the living room at home. So by working with the reflections of the wall, the sound is able to create such sound experience. By having such room dependency, um, we also um, provide a microphone and that the sound was actually able to adapt to your living room at home. That is a microphone. Yes, it's not designed to be beautiful, <laughs> it's more designed to be functional. So that's like the average upper body height. And then you can put the microphone on your couch, and then this height here matches your ear height. So that's why we have such functional design. It's beautiful. So it's not meant to have to put your jacket on it or something. But like, so the my fans have it's also very, very often. Uh, yes. So like we're working with the room calibration, the sound was actually able to uh, create a sound experience which matches like 514 because the sound was really able to understand what's the distance between sound on left wall, sound on right wall, where's the custom sitting, how high is the ceiling, and try something new. So here we, um, the end of the football arena, we just try to capture um, the state in the atmosphere uh, with a new MBO microphone. So MBO is not only in the sound bar, so um, at the center we also have like, microphones, and also in here we put the MBO technology. So a bit of music.
the shape is uh, also from the uh, Greek, uh, Greek uh, let's say, Greek instrument, uh, harp, and uh, the name Euterp is uh, Euterp was one of the nine muses from Greece and uh, giver of the light. So uh, there are some interesting, interesting stuff about uh, about the name. Like this, there is a. Um, also uh, diets for low and high voltage. Low voltage and after 30 seconds there is a high voltage. Well, what, what does it mean? It, it, this 30 seconds helps a lot because of the lifetime of the, of the tubes. Tubes are, the lifetime of the tubes are, let's say, uh, tubes last longer. And uh, it reduces some more functions or uh, some, let's say, unexpected things to, to happen. For those of you Pro probably know, most of you know me. Uh, my name's Johan, I've been with KEF basically, I'm getting really old now, since 1989. Um, Ron joined in the same year, uh, does international runarounds for us. But to present you to George as well. George has been with us, God, 10 years now, right? Yeah. Uh, George joined us, um, did his internship in acoustics in uh, Germany mm -hmm. at Sennheiser and uh, now he's been in with us for 10 years, we've been pretty busy. Um, most of you will know Jack Ockley Brown, uh, Kef is still based, uh, UK, all, all the ideas and design go there but we're pretty busy guys. And George is now Deputy Head of Acoustics, running the department. Um, the world has changed. Um, it struck me, I was on the road uh, last year, and I thought, holy crap. GP, uh, who own KEF, who, who own KEF, have owned KEF now for over a quarter of a century. It's just like, oh my God, where, where did the time go? Um, we all know that the industry is, I think you, you don't have to overstress, full of turmoil now. Full of turmoil, mergers, acquisitions. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's pretty chaotic nowadays. Um, but KEF has, under the... Uh, auspices of GP um, become a, a kind of a really stable standard and it, it, it has, I'm happy to say, benefited the brand. Um, as you all know, KEF continues to build a very broad palette of products, um, but particularly about 15 or so years ago, um, there was a real push within KEF to, it, it costs money, uh, an investment to really care about how the speaker's styled, uh, about building in, um, you don't have to love them, but really cool design, um, products like the Blade products like Nuance, uh, and now in the more in, in the more consumer, uh, mildly priced products, but still beautiful, because people demand to live with their, um, with, with their stuff. You are seeing a rush towards fully active systems uh, from many, many manufacturers. Um, we took the as you know, the DNA of our most famous product, the S50 mini monitor, and transplanted it and made that active wireless. But we did it the hard way um, by actually building everything up from scratch. So it's our own software, our own firmware, our own ecosystem. Now, even going so far as the, the apps which are in the S50 wireless and the apps which are in now the new uh, baby LSXs are our own, specifically tailored to that. It takes a bit longer, but we believe the net result uh, is very, very, very gratifying. It's, it's worth doing. The average KEF consumer was, a few years back, about 57 years old. 
Um, now, thanks to the LS50, LS50 wireless and this product, it's a shade under 40, which is good news. It's, it's really good news. Somebody like, for instance, my daughter, um, who's 27, doing very well, but even a product like this um, is a very expensive product for her, right? At, at, at what is it, 1200 euros? Using Bluetooth, but it's also Spotify Connect uh, compatible, or I've now taught my daughter Tidal, so we've got our own Tidal app. But we even go as far as the, that they're room endpoints, um, which is much more sophisticated. So it's something for everybody. Not only that, is is people uh, the way they use them. Uh, we've noticed with the S50 wireless and this is, is is really interesting in very different sort of ways. Um, I'm talking about connecting legacy devices. You know. Connect your CD player, connect your turntable, whatever. So we have stuck with the principle of the master speaker having all your all your input possibilities, right? Uh, right there. Um, on the NSX now, there is a USB, but it's a USB power out. So I can do all sorts of other things. You know, if voice control is my thing. I can power up an Amazon, Amazon Echo Dot and loop it, into, loop it into the auxiliary or a Google Chromecast, but the buggers have, uh, have, have, uh, have discontinued the Chromecast Audio Puck, but they're still really available, and there's lots of other devices. So the answer is as much compatibility as possible. On the LSX, we have taken the departure from the LS50 wireless. The LS50 wireless needs Power, power, as you know, and it relies on, it must have an umbilical between the loudspeakers. Um, with the LSX, we've gone for the either or option, and they talk to each other by our own protocol. So if you want, if you need the convenience of wireless connection between the loudspeakers, does that stable up to about six meters, and they talk to each other basically a red book at uh, CD quality. However, even on the baby LSX, we do give the option of an, attaching an ethernet umbilical between the two and then the resolution is doubled. So, for those obsessed with high resolution. Last but not least, the, um, there was, we breathed a sigh of relief um, 12 hours before the Munich show, uh, it, they've now, um, and it'll be a push update uh, launching in about a week and a half, which is going to turn this product into the LSX into a whole new animal, which has been appro approved for Apple AirPlay 2. And of course, the implications of that are multi zone, multi room, synced party play. Um, you're going to listen to it later, and uh, I, I think that that will be an important part of it as well. But definitely, there are a lot of available content out there, a lot of uh, streaming services, a lot of devices, uh, a lot of areas from where you can get uh, using, and, and it seems that also a lot of people is actually listening uh, to music from their TV. My girlfriend is using her TV normally for, for uh, listening to music. I put speakers in her home. Um, and you also all know that speakers in TVs are generally crappy. Uh, they are limited by the very narrow <coughs> building. Uh, 
place they are in, in TVs, and the, the push and the wish for elegant, uh, simple designs. So we need to, we, we, we wanted to put our, uh, our idea of how we could improve sound on TV. I know there's a lot of sound bars out there, and uh, of different quality, I would say. We wanted to, um, to make it our way, of course. One thing that we were quite focused about, because we are not uh, Panasonic or something or whoever who makes integrated systems, and, and uh, uh, we are, in the country, a universal supplier of speakers. So we wanted the speaker to be used with televisions to be universal, connective to different kinds of TVs and other sources as well as we, as we now are doing it. Uh, so you would say it was even uh, uh, future proof because if you change your TV you can use it again. But at least we wanted to have one speaker that could work with a lot of TVs. And we wanted it to be convenient. There is uh, enough fuss on TVs and video streaming and so on, setting up different menus and uh, so on. So there should not be a lot of fuss related to the speaker, at least. And then, of course, it should sound great because it's a deadly speaker. That's what we live from. That's offering high audio performance in any class. So what did we do to, uh, to do a sound bar? Because of course, uh, the case is the same. We, we need to make it shallow, we need to make it visual appealing, uh, want to uh, build something that people want to have on their walls. The families, not only the men, but the females, uh, the wives and uh, the families as well. So we needed to put in uh, <coughs> as much sound machine as possible into a, a really uh, compact design. Um, we have used four three and a half inch uh, woofers or mid woofers uh, that have been optimized for use in a, in a very compact space. And, and of course we've used some of the knowledge we gained from uh, designing the catch. So they are <coughs> derivatives of, of the woofers used in the catch. There are two 21 uh, millimeter soft domes. They're pointing forwards, uh, as you will. Can I point with this one? Okay, you find them here. And the roof is pointing forwards and the roof is pointing backwards. Um, then we have uh, four passive radiators. And all the roofers and the radiators are placed on the back and the uh, front, back side and front side. So they uh, cancel out the vibrations. So it doesn't rattle against the wall or generate uh, unwanted sound that way. And then we uh, put in four uh, 50 watt amplifiers. That's uh, 50 watt peak power, 30 watt continuous power. And uh, then we use signal processing uh, for most of the cross overing. Actually, the, the crossover between the tweeters and the woofers in the front are done uh, normal with a passive uh, crossover. So, uh, what do we do to get the woofers to play? We uh, need to connect them to some amplifiers. And what comes out now is, uh, is a scheduled uh, diagram, principal diagram of the electronics. And sometimes uh, I find it uh, overwhelming to look at it and, and when you look into a product it's difficult to see what it is. So I try to make it on a, on a very principal basis and maybe it would be fun to see as well. I hope not. So. so the four speakers are connected to the four amplifier channels and the woofers on the front are connected to the tweeters as well. So the amplifier channels in the front runs both tweeters and woofers. And then on the other end of the signal pass, we need some inputs. 
and we wanted it to be universal. So we added several inputs. At the top, you can see we have listed a HDMI auto return channel input. Um, and that we believe will be the main connectivity for most applications. Um, that gives us the opportunity to control the speaker through the HDMI for most features at least, because there is one feature on, on the speaker that uh, is not supported by HDMI. And uh, it has been, by the way, quite a work to get to interpret all of the different HDMI uh, commands from the TV and translate into something sensible for the speaker. But um, we've tested it with a lot of TVs, and I guess it's not surprising to you that, that uh, HDMI uh, requires work and, and to be careful. Um, so a little bit about Isotech. Uh, we've been on the market almost 20 years, and we are a specialist in the field that we are in, and that is called power. So we basically uh, produce very high grade, audio grade power cleaning systems designed to not only protect, but enhance the performance of uh, all audio components. So it's something that you would add to an audio system which would upgrade the performance of every single component. We've normally been working in this two channel market segment, uh, but the opportunity to provide something for the custom installation market was something we couldn't overlook. And so over the last years, we've been developing a system to enable custom installers to not only benefit from a cleaner power supply, but also get greater reliability, greater control, and greater end results on that system that they put in. So um, I'm I'm very happy that uh, uh, this uh, ISA corporation was that was getting larger and even more important on the world market. Yeah, and I really want to support this. And yeah, uh, okay. So uh, this year. Uh, uh, we again um, want to present you two products. Uh, one is an analog product and one is a digital product. Yeah? Why i pushing now in the last years always digital? Because um, I want to get out of our business uh, this uh, black and white thinking. Yeah? Everything what is analog is good and everything what is digital is bad. This is just wrong. There are existing good solution and bad solution. Yeah? So it, there can be uh, digital can be also very exciting, yeah, uh, and analog can be also very disappointed. Yeah, uh, so uh, this is the reason why we invested in project in the last years also um, in analog and digital. Two different engineers; they have nothing to do with each other. Yeah, so it's a complete separate development. Also, to introduce this record, um, I don't know if you have uh, seen the press release of this record. Um, so we are, uh, uh, we are very, very proud about the cooperation with the Vienna Philharmonic. Uh, the Vienna Philharmonic have given us the possibility to use their archive. So we are just uh, taking, listening, uh, taking out of the archive um, um, original master tapes, uh, which are still usable. And you will be curious, yeah, or let's say, the bad message is yeah, that most of the tapes are not usable anymore, so it can be only prepared digital that you can somehow listen to them, because the, the mistakes uh, the, from the tapes, the, the, uh, the degradation of the tape is already so high. <coughs> yeah. So the idea is that I, I will bring uh, with the Vienna Philharmonic 12 uh, different pieces with 12 uh, different um, uh, uh, composers um, and uh, with 12 different dirigents. Uh, which have a very, very long uh, tradition with the Vienna Philharmonic. Yeah? And this one, uh, for sure, uh, Beethoven is, uh, is very, very close to, to, Vienna, to the Vienna Philharmonic, and also Karl Böhm was for many years the, uh, the master dirigent. And that's original recording uh, from the Musikverein, 
ja, in 1971. We have uh, done in the last uh, close 30 years something very magic. Never, never, ever, um, <coughs> an old technology was coming back. It's the first time. First time in all technologies is that uh, a technology was, was away, was coming back and had this big launch. And there was just uh, at the vinyl, con vinyl making conference, where Michael was also yeah, in, in Berlin, yeah, and it's just a big, big. Um, big market when you see how many people are there and how many people are living at the moment again from, from the analog business. It's, it's, it's a really big conference, yeah? but uh, this is fact. Yeah? When they buy it from Amazon and it's somewhere produced somewhere, yeah, which they have no idea how to make a turntable proper, and then they buy a Rolling Stones record, which is uh, recorded from a CD, yeah? then I have to tell you, yeah, Spotify on a Bose SoundLink sounds better. <laughs> And the customer says, "Oh, these analog guys, yeah, they only want to make my, ma 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 they want to take my money, yeah. It's only a gag, yeah. And you know what you're doing with gags? What what you're doing with toys? You put it in the corner and so you should search your next toy. And we are living, project is living from these customers. They buy a debut, and five years later, they buy a classic, and five years later they buy an extension or I don't know a Lin or a Transrotor or." A the only thing what I did is I took my original project one, which I started 1991, and just did everything better. In every respect, everything what I know, everything what I experienced from the high end, I tried to put in a very low cost turntable. So, and these are simple things. Like, for example, Azimuth adjust adjustment, VTA adjustment, and the adjust adjustable feet. So tell me any company, even under 2,000 euros, who has these features, all three. You will get in the trouble to find one. <laughs> yeah. So, <coughs> damped counterweight. Nobody's using damped counterweight low, low, uh, in, in, in the low class. Why? Because it's expensive. Yeah. But you need a damped counterweight. Why? Because you have a resonance frequency of the cartridge. I don't take an off-the-shelf cartridge. I designed my own cartridge with Autophone. Live Johansson was helping me to get my sound out of the cartridge, which I like. So a huge investment also in the cartridge. For sure, it's based on a 2M, but it's not an off-shelf Autophone cartridge. Yeah? So that's my uh, Picket cartridge. Yeah? Then we incorporate in this also our carbon aluminum sandwich construction. Why? Because there was a journalist uh, in England who said the carbon is fantastic, yeah? but I can measure some resonances there. And he was right. Oh, I, uh, I can also listen it. Yeah? So I made a combination out with aluminum. Why? Because aluminum gives a, a better damping in the carbon. So get the combination between stiffness and damping. And as you know, in all project uh, turntables, yeah, we have um, an AC, as a DC AC power generator, yeah, to clean up the power and to give uh, the motor um, um, a cleaner power. And we redesigned our motor suspension. Yeah, but the first thing is, yeah, never, never, never hollow spaces. That's a no-go. Yeah. Once you have a plastic cabinet, you're yeah, molded, which costs in five euros because you it's a mold, bam, 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 cost nothing. Yeah. Forget it because you, boo, everything is, mm -hmm. you, you know, you get the speaker effect. Yeah. It's just not working. Yeah. So plastic, hollow sound, this makes loudness effect like crazy. Yeah. Second thing is what a lot of uh, people are doing is particle boards. Particle boards yeah, are way, 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 way cheaper than MDF. And particle boards with the foil are way, 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 way cheaper than eight lacquers like we have here, eight, eight layers of lacquers. Yeah? So these are just, you know, and what is the result? A particle board has more air enclosure, <laughs> and by more air enclosure, 
you have more loudness. It's just facts, yeah? The next thing is, uh, as I men men mentioned, uh, there are more things, yeah? Cartridge, yeah? This cartridge is not a $5 cartridge. Everybody's using at the moment three, four, five dollar cartridge. Even famous companies here yeah, who brought out turntables here, yeah, they were using a, a, a variation of the 1891. <coughs> this is a $5 cartridge and it sounds like $5, I'm sorry. Yeah? This is five times, well, five times, six times more expensive, only from the production price because orthophone is you cannot get for $5, it's impossible. Yeah? So these are basic things. Then why we can, why we can do VTA adjustment? Because our flange is metal. It's not a plastic flange. Looking at most of the turntables, plastic flanges everywhere, every Far East turntable, plastic flange. Why? Because it's cheap. Why you need a, it's not only the VTA adjustment, but the whole mounting of the toner is so critical. It has to be super, super tight and you have to stop the resonances. As you know, uh, in, in 2012, the last uh, CDM9 Pro from Philips was shipped. Yeah? And all at that time, uh, the production was extremely limited because all the tools were worn out and actually the last production were by far not good anymore. Yeah. And since that time, already actually the last 10, 20 years, all the CD player produced uh, uh, were based on Sanyo and Sony drives. Yeah. And the whole thing, what the industry was making is some more or less better servers because, uh, you know, the, the the chips and everything was getting better, but allowing to control it. Yeah, but the mechanism itself was a, a plastic piece. And um, and as you as as CD play as a CD player manufacturer denied for many many years that the mechanical thing uh, of a CD player is is not relevant. Yeah, we know already today this is not true. Yeah, uh, CD player uh, is a precision instrument. Yeah. And uh, this is also one reason I realized uh, that uh, uh, CD was going down because uh, the industry, especially the dealers and also the software industry, did not communicate with the consumer how delicate a CD and a CD player is. A CD. So we looked at some examples of how that is done and I think an excellent example is the KEF LS50W. Um, it's good looking, good sounding, everything packaged in so that you can get any form of connected to you want. But then we examined that in terms of also the traditional hi-fi market. The limitation with uh, going the route of packaging everything in is that you have no possibility of improving the sound of the system. You buy it, it is your system. It's packaged in the DSP and the DAX and the amplification and the streaming capabilities situation. So we thought, if we're going to do it, can we keep um, a significant part of the speaker all analog? Um, so, and then split it apart so the speaker can function both as a traditional higher end but active speaker. So all that you give up is the uh, possibility of changing the power application, but it still works in the context of an analog system. But then how do we add the capability of connecting any source? So, in one sense, this is a traditional active speaker. So it's analog, line level crossovers, um, and three amplifiers. Um, all based on class AB technology. So a pure class AB amplifier for the tweeter of 40 watts capability. And the ratio of amplification I use through each of the different drivers is based on their relative efficiencies. Tweeters are always easy to get efficient. <coughs> so the power amplification you need when you're connected directly to the tweeter is relatively small. So 40 watts. Mid-range has got 100 watts and the base section 160 watts and they're all packaged in this cast aluminium base here and when you look at what's the efficiency of a ask, what I'm just about to say thank you for <laughs> <laughs> thank you for interrupting to ask what I'm just about to tell you <laughs> so if we look at uh, efficiency of amplifiers so let's look at class D 
and Class D has the capability of maximum proficiency approaching around 95%. Now that depends on the exact architecture, but also the, the type of signal you're reproducing. So best case is 95%. Best case in a Class A B amplifier is it's between 65 67% that range. Now that doesn't sound much better than 95, but what matters is what's left over. If it's 95 proficient, only 5% is generated as heat or losses. But with a class A amplifier, let's say about 35%, so seven times more loss than in a class D, um, which means seven times more heat, it means bigger power supply, it means bigger heat sinking. Um, so if we can make moderate improvements in the efficiency of the class A amplifier, we make huge improvements in how much is wasted as heat. So that's what we've done. So we get somewhere around 80%, 85%, um, and that presents a much lower amount of wasted heat. It's not long when she's away And no sunshine when she's gone She's always gone too long The idea is it's all analog, all based on class AB variant technology. And the goal is to make those electronics transparent enough so that when you upgrade the rest of the system, you'll hear those upgrades. And we prove it so bit back to ourselves quite often when we go between the Discovery Music server uh, in the mode where you come analog out from its internal DAX um, into the speaker, or we switch to the Alchemy DDP2, which is a much more capable um, streaming input room endpoint DAC, much higher quality, we can clearly hear the improvement in sound. So that met one goal, reconnect. Um, this is a box that broadcasts three wireless channels, left, right, and subwoofer. So we can easily add in a powered subwoofer if you need it. Um, and it is a room endpoint a Discovery Connect endpoint, uh, Spotify Connect, um, AirPlay, Bluetooth, and it's also DNLA compliant. So lots of programs that allow you to take whatever music source you have and on a network access that as an endpoint. Um, and of course it's a concentric system, uh, as you might expect from me. Um, so four inch <coughs> aluminium mid-range, one inch tweeter, and five inch, five and a quarter inch base driver. All new drives, not the same drivers as we use in the uh, Unify speaker. It's, it looks very similar, but it's all new, new cone, new tweeter, uh, new matching horn, new woofer shape, and uh, new chassis. So quite a change, quite an upgrade from Valid point. An active speaker means a, drive, a, a power amplifier for each drive unit directly connected and then a low level uh, active crossover. Uh, as opposed to powered speakers, when you do the very low cost speakers, it's two passive speakers and either an amplifier built into each speaker or more commonly a stereo amplifier in one cabinet and a uh, a speaker level connection through to the other entirely passive speaker. So that, yes, I would call a powered speaker. Power does not necessarily mean active channel. So we chose a different system. It's a proprietary wireless connection protocol, not on the Wi-Fi network. You can get your signals to the Discovery Connect on the Wi-Fi network or direct, but we transmit over our own proprietary link. Power cores are more expensive than the speakers. Yes, <laughs> you noticed. And they, but they're, they make a big difference. They do. Yeah.
today is basically the next step for us because when it comes to AV, uh, there is a big, big chance of mixing both uh, classic hi-fi systems as well as CI solutions. Uh, Atmos is a very good example there. So that's the reason why our approach has been the very same on the AV than the one we've had since the beginning of the brand on the stereo applications. Let's say really high end. Uh, we developed an entire solution when it comes to CI, uh, making sure that we have a super uh, efficiency between our CI product and our classic uh, lineup for Atmos once again. Or maybe at some point, sometimes, based on the new uh, rooms designs and so on, we uh, see more and more. Uh, in the living room, you have less and less walls uh, in between the living room and kitchen and so on where it makes obviously things super difficult when it comes to uh, rear channels. Since there are no walls, you cannot really enjoy uh, rear channels. Uh, we have solutions to fix that problem, and you saw that last year with the inceding angled and so on. Today, uh, this will be more uh, electronic based, uh, because um, I don't know how many of you, of you have been to ISC show, okay, and uh, Munich uh, recently. Almost. Okay, so uh, maybe you already saw uh, Astral 16 at Munich. Uh, we had two demo rooms on the booth. One was two channel oriented with Stella, and the other one was 7.2 system uh, with Kanta and Astral 16. C in a drag race while towing an Alfa Romeo. We don't inject noise into the AC system so that we don't pollute the environment in which the system exists from which it draws its power. So modularity is key to this design. We have that basic amplifier that we can add a DM35 DAC or an SM35 Prisma module. So the basic amp, it has XLR plus RCA inputs. We have something called wake plus select. If it senses an input, it will wake itself up, go to that input. Or if it's on and senses an input, it will go to that input. To that, future updates will be MQA and room tested so that we'll be able to add that. And in fact, we'll probably put this in something we're calling now the super DAC so that someone can put MQA in a higher resolution ESS chip or choose to have the standard DAC if budget intrudes. And then we have the SM35 Prisma Streaming Module. How many are familiar with Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab? I think everybody is. <laughs> yeah. So, um, Josh Bazaar, um, back in the USA, um, really wanted to be here to kick this presentation off. And so, um, when I was uh, speaking with him the other day, um, he, he said, well, I'll send you something. You can read it if you want, if you'd like. And I said, well, yeah, but why not, since you're the reason I'm standing here today. Um, so Josh Bazaar uh, works, uh, he's essentially the number two man at uh, Music Direct in the USA, but he's much bigger than that. Um, he's worked with Jim Davis, who owns Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab since uh, 2000 or 1999, for, for longer than that, for many years. And so Josh actually sent me, it's actually a really long email. <laughs> so I'm not going to read all of it, but there is something that's very, uh, I think, apropos. Uh, because MoFi Electronics comes from Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab, and uh, without Josh, um, Josh Bazaar, there wouldn't be a, a MoFi Electronics. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. They, they didn't really need me to sell the vinyl. <laughs> it was selling quite well um, without me. But uh, anyway, uh, Josh relays a story from 20 years ago, and I want to read a little bit of it because I think it's very uh, perfect for a mobile fidelity, a mobile fidelity sound lab and, and our new products at MoFi Electronics. He writes, our company has purchased the remaining stock from the warehouse after the doors were shuttered for mobile fidelity sound lab. And we had an overwhelming response from music lovers all over the world. The phone was ringing off the hook from people trying to get their hands on the last mobile fidelity pressings. This was actually right before Jim bought the company. So, so all day I sat on the phone uh, talking to record collectors about their catalogs, about their love of mobile fidelity, their love of music, uh, their love of vinyl, and we talked about their music systems in detail. I was surprised to learn that many mobile fidelity record lovers did not have top shelf <coughs> systems. In fact, many asked me what type of analog turntable I should buy. Um, so Josh goes on to say, uh, um, 
uh, basically they uh, they were, uh, well the, the valuable out of print music collections they would talk about those different uh, things for mobile fidelity and that's when the idea hit Josh that maybe uh, a lot of the music lovers could get introduced to uh, a better product or a better turntable um, and that's when the idea hit him that the master tape or the original master tape which is the mobile fidelity sound lab um, a big part of mobile fidelity sound lab would uh, would then become um, would then become the impetus to create a, a turntable electronics as well as uh, phono preamps and cartridges um, to allow mobile fidelity to control more of the master chain um, and honor that original master tape. So, what I want to do is uh, talk a little bit um, about uh, mobile fidelity sound lab before I get into the product that we're presenting, which is the the ultra deck of the mobile. Uh, MoFi Electronics Ultra Deck. And Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab, actually, uh, from 1977 is when they started producing uh, uh, master, uh, master recordings um, in California. But actually, Brad Miller started the company in the, in the 50s. And he would take mobile recording equipment and record uh, nature sounds and trains. Um, so, from that uh, grew Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab, where we basically remaster uh, uh, from original master tape. And I want to go through a couple of the photos because the modern day uh, mastering studio, you have the vault where you have some of the original master tapes uh, that are in play for, uh, for that particular uh, time period. When I visited, uh, they actually had uh, the cars, Heartbeat City. And it was the first time I actually held a master tape in my hands. And it was interesting for me, it was quite emotional because that uh, the Cars was one of the first concerts I went to when I was 16 years old. So here I was holding the original session tapes from the, from the master recording, which I, I was blown away. And it had original notes scribbled on across. Uh, it, it was quite profound. And at that point I learned that uh, uh, these are real treasures and they, uh, they have to be uh, truly honored. And then I met all the gentlemen that work at Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab, uh, Craig Wunderlich, uh, one of the engineers, Sean Britton, um, Rob Laverde, and I learned of their passion. Uh, and this is actually Rob Laverde's studio here. Um, Craig Wunderlich uh, doesn't quite look so nice and tidy, <laughs> although it's very, uh, very much a work, uh, a work uh, studio. And then uh, we have the studio deck, uh, which uh, the buttons on the studio deck was some of the influence, actually most of the influence for our power button on, the, on both the studio deck and the ultra deck, which we're presenting today. And then uh, the Neumann cutter head. It was interesting because uh, Tim DePeravicini, who, who was uh, uh, befriended long ago by uh, Josh Bazaar um, and was responsible for the mastering chain for all the electronics, the EAR Yoshino electronics that are full uh, throughout the, the mastering chain in Sebastopol. Uh, he manages and maintains the cutter head for us, the Norman cutter head, which is, it's interesting, it's a V-twin configuration. And uh, when we started to look at cartridge, uh, cartridge companies to partner with to develop MoFi cartridges uh, for our turntables, uh, it was very interesting to, to see that uh, uh, Audio-Technica had created a V-twin engine, that, uh, and they offered us to use this engine actually before they used it themselves. So this was a, a Everything just kind of fell into place. But of course, as Josh says, this took 15 to 20 years <laughs> of, uh, of getting to the point where they could develop this. Uh, um, so that was uh, essentially Josh's idea to create the next step in what we felt was the true reproduction of the original master recording. So um, another side note is uh, the master, mastering engineers, uh, Rob Liberte and Sean Britton and Craig Wunderlich, would always ask Josh for a turntable, or maybe a more affordable turntable that they could play their test pressing back on. And uh, um, Josh would always send different turntables in, and they were really picky, <laughs> the engineers. So they would always say, yeah, it's, it's a little too much this, it's a little too much that. So over the years, Josh started to catalog some ideas from, the, from our engineers. And so when we developed the turntables, both the Ultra Deck and the Studio Deck, uh, we made sure to involve the engineers at the, at the mastering studio because we really wanted them to be proud of the product and we wanted their advice on, uh, on what we need to do to make it better. Um, so that's a big part of, uh, 
of Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab. Um, and uh, I, I threw this slide in just because some of the latest things we've done with the Marvin Gaye, what's going on, um, the UD1S, the one step, where we can take a, a from the lacquer, we create a stamper. Um, so we eliminate a couple steps in the mastering process, or sorry, the, the, uh, the producing process. Uh, and we get a much cleaner, clearer sound um, because of it. So it's, uh, it's pretty nice. The complete MoFi experience actually goes well beyond the turntable, the photo stage, the uh, accessories, uh, but obviously starts for us with the music at Mobile Fidelity Sound Lab. Um, and the turntable we want to talk about um, to present uh, also wouldn't exist without this gentleman here. Alan Perkins uh, was one of the uh, people that, that uh, Josh turned to early on to, to help develop the, both the studio deck and the ultra deck. So he's actually our lead, in, uh, lead designer and lead engineer. Um, and if you, if you know Alan Perkins, uh, the current company Spiral Groove, before that it was with uh, um, iMedia and before that Soda. Um, he's obviously developed a really nice turntables throughout years and, and not too long ago received an award uh, in the US for uh, his SG 1.2 turntable. Um, so it was really nice to have Alan to tell us, hey, you, you really need to consider these aspects when you're developing a turntable. Um, the tone arm, uh, having a, a little longer tone arm than most products at these price ranges um, was also an important aspect uh, for uh, um, led by Alan Perkins. Um, but there's also additional things that I'll go into a little later. Um, and then we wanted to build a product in America. Uh, Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs, an American company. We wanted to establish uh, um, our own factory. Um, it's difficult, to, as you can imagine, to, to find a turntable or a vinyl uh, uh, turntable manufacturer. <laughs> just say, here's what we want, and, and they'll say, oh, we can build that. Um, so we developed over a, 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 about a 12-month period, we developed our own factory in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And that was uh, headed up by John Schaefer. Uh, John is uh, formerly from Wadia, another friend of John, Josh Bazaar and, and Music Direct in the US. Uh, and so uh, Josh, sorry, John, John Schaefer was able to help us develop um, a really nice uh, small factory in Ann Arbor where we produce uh, the, not only the turntable, <coughs> but locally we produce uh, both turntables, but we locally produce uh, the phono stages and many of the parts you see on the turntable. In fact, over 90% of the parts of the turntable are within 200 kilometers of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, the motor, for example, comes from Hearst, uh, Hearst Motors from Indiana. Um, so but that was a unique uh, aspect for us. And then we also felt we could hold the tolerance much tighter if we did it ourselves. Um, and that uh, was a, a, also a big factor. Um, as you imagine, you can imagine all the electric, or sorry, all the uh, mechanical parts that go together for a turntable. Uh, it's important to be able to hold your tolerances to a very uh, high level. And John Schaefer was able to do that in Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor is close to Detroit, Michigan, and there's a lot of good. Uh, factories and a lot of good suppliers in that whole Detroit uh, uh, metro area. Um, so the Ultranic Plus M is what we're produce, uh, so we're, what I'm presenting here for ISA. Um, the Plus M means uh, with a master tracker cartridge. And that's our best moving magnet cartridge. Uh, it has a microlinear uh, stylus. Um, it also has the V-twin engine with the dual magnet and dual toroidal uh, that mimics our um, our uh, Neumann uh, cutter head at Sebastopol. Uh, it has a 10 inch tone arm. Um, it has a little thicker platter um, that is Delrin uh, or POM based material. Um, a little thicker than the studio deck which is our entry level uh, turntable. And it's quite a bit heavier. Um, and then uh, probably one of the most interesting things is uh, early in the project um, Josh Bazaar uh, reached out to Mike Latvis from Harmonic Resonance Systems, or HRS. And uh, Mike was uh, instrumental in developing feet um, that really, uh, if, if he hadn't developed them, it possibly could have killed the project. Um, in fact, there was a six month period where we didn't know if the project was going to continue, about three and a half years ago. 
um, or three years ago, simply because Josh wanted the turntable to be able to go on any type of situation, be able to sit on any type of, uh, of rack, equipment rack. <laughs> So let's start off with some basics and just kind of to see that we're in the same place and, and move forward together. So would everybody agree that um, we believe that when a speaker cone is driven forward, the cabinet could be moved back? If there's nothing physically to hold the cabinet in place, the cabinet would be driven back. The result is that the, that the energy push forward is reduced by that offsetting movement back. So holding a speaker rigid in place is very important. <coughs> so what do we do? We put a speaker down on a surface. We might excite that surface if it's, if it's not significant, and that can give off dissonant sound. And, but there's another phenomena that happens that I think we have to, have to be aware of, and that is that a speaker on a surface actually has an internal <coughs> reflection that comes back up inside. And you could think of that like bolting a pipe to the wall, you hit it with a hammer, the vibration goes down the pipe and the inversion comes back up the pipe again. So this introduces smear into a speaker and any artifacts that are similar in both channels, we perceive them to be in the middle. So it could potentially collapse the sound stage and become very two-dimensional. Okay? So that, that second point I don't think is as widely understood by people. People think about exciting that surface. So the next step would be to make the surface more significant denser, more solid, more massive. So it might be made out of steel, it might be marble, granite, concrete, but the idea is not to excite that surface. But now we have structure-borne noise. It's carried through that structure, it causes anomalies in this space. One speaker communicates to the other. It moves 8 to 12 times faster through a solid surface than it does through air. And it could be causing problems into an adjacent area, upsetting your neighbors. When they hear the same, when they hear the same song over and over again, <laughs> so we might put something underneath the speaker to try to. That's referred to as the boundary condition, the point between the speaker and the supporting surface. So we may try to mitigate that by putting on spikes or some other surface. So it's by reducing that surface connection, point loading it, we have a higher concentration on those points higher pounds per square inch or kilograms per uh, square centimeter. And the idea is to try to mitigate some of that. Uh, you can use dissimilar metals, you can use, you know, anybody that's familiar with electronics sees that nice cone shape. We think of a diode, we think of energy passing down and, coming ba and not coming back up. But in fact, any mechanical surface between a speaker and the supporting surface can create that, can draw those reflections back up into a speaker. And that's common pretty much everywhere. So the final thing we might consider is putting isolation underneath a speaker. Having some <coughs> type of material that's resilient that will mitigate that transfer back and forth from the structure and exciting that, that underlying structure. But the biggest issue with that is if you've got something that's homogeneous, it only has a narrow band in which it works. <coughs> and you might be dealing with a wide variation of, of <coughs> weights as well. And secondly, any homogeneous material, when you put a speaker on it, the motive force is way up here. So the, t the speaker causes deflections in that surface and could cause anomalies and, and changes as well. So we hear expressions like the isolation sucks the base out, or we don't have accuracy, we don't have good, sharp performance with isolation. And in fact, we've now come back to point number one that as the cone moves forward, the speaker cabinet moves back, and you get a you get reduced performance. Okay? So are, are we together with that? That's kind of the four or five steps along the way with speaker placement. The isoacoustics design, and this is very typical. This, 
This is the Gaia, what we have underneath these speakers here. But the isoacoustic design has an upper isolator, a lower isolator, and there's three components, so there's a high degree of isolation. If I manage the shape, thickness, and durometer of those isolators, we can extend its performance across the entire audio spectrum and even sub-bass uh, sub section too. The lower section acts as a suction cup, so it adheres to, the, to that surface. The upper isolator is bolted to the housing, which is bolted to the speaker, so there's a very positive connection. And these isolators embrace the inserts laterally, so we have lateral resistance. So we don't have that situation where the cone's moving forward, the speaker moves back. We don't have that suck out of the base at the bottom. And you can see these things in an anechoic chamber that, they're, that we don't have losses as a result of that isolation <coughs> design, if you please. So this is very typical of, uh, of all of our products and how they're, on how they're constructed. So the points up here, upper and lower isolator, high degree of isolation. There's no single element that connects the speaker to the floor. So that's where that high degree of isolation comes into play. We manage energy in all directions and we, we maintain that energy on axis. In fact, we always recommend that the, that the logo is placed forward or 180 degrees back because there's higher resistance laterally to negate any type of oscillation that may naturally occur in the isolator itself. So again, by managing the shape, thickness, and durometer, we manage that energy in the speaker, we keep it aligned, and we get to great performance and, and clarity as a result. So we eliminate smear, clarity and focus, tighter base, improved stereo imaging, and it creates a three-dimensional sound stage that blossoms open. That last point refers to what I mentioned earlier, that if you have reflections coming back up into the speaker, any artifacts that are similar in both channels are perceived to be in the middle and they collapse the sound stage to become very two-dimensional. And so hopefully you hear that it opens right <coughs> up and, and becomes very three-dimensional. The National Research Council. So I think uh, Doug and Paul Barton were kind enough to give up some time for us to go up there and, uh, and play. <coughs> but we, uh, we always start off in the anechoic chamber. We take a control speaker and we run it through the spectrum. And then we put our products underneath it. In this case, it's the Gaia. And it's 100% coherent. There's no variation. In fact, the run-to-run -run variation might be 0.17% of a dB. And when we put the Gaia's underneath, we stay within that range again. So there's no coloration. So for those that are you know, they're looking at this type of information to look for where benefits or losses are, are gained, are found, uh, where there's no coloration is the, is the main point, and that's critically important. That doesn't look good. There we are. <coughs> so we install spikes, and we use the laser vibrometer. And you'll notice that with running the same sweep frequency through the speaker, this is what we get from the laser vibrometer. <laughs> that fly keeps passing by. So we see this energy coming back up into the speaker, and then when we install the Gaia, you can see that it's greatly attenuated. And look where it's happening. It's right in the middle of the piano. We're not all subsonic. It's happening throughout, in fact, it happens throughout the whole audio range, but the bulk of it is happening right around that midpoint in the piano. Those are the artifacts coming back up. Those are the artifacts that are collapsing the sound stage. But you might think, well, wait a second. A speaker can have lots of resonance in it. It can have lots of harmonics. How do we know that we're reading things? How do we know that this is exclusively related to that boundary condition? the speaker and its connection to the supporting surface. So we built a test rig. This rig has the Gaia's underneath it. It's got spikes on <coughs> solenoids, and it's got bungee cords. And we could change from one system to the next, and we maintain a height difference of less than a quarter of an inch, less than six millimeters. 
And that, that's critical because that's half a wavelength at 20,000 hertz. So any change within six millimeters really has a, has a null or neglig uh, negligible difference to the acoustic uh, output. So by going back and forth, you can see the bottom line here, the brown line, is the bungee cord. Next one is the Gaia. They're behaving very similar. And then finally, it's the spike. So that delta there, it's that energy that's coming back up into the speaker. That's the energy that's causing the smear. That's the energy that's potentially causing the collapse in the sound stage as well. And by the way, when you run, when you're using the bungee cord and you listen to it, it sounds terrible, as we said earlier, because the speaker's just floating in air. It, it, to me, it sounds like foam. You can hear the content, but it's got no definition, it's got no edge. Okay. So again, this is all referred to as boundary condition. On the left hand side, it's that pipe bolted to a wall, the vibration hitting that hard surface, and then the inversion coming back up the pipe again. And the right hand side, when you've got some type of absorption, you can mitigate that, that transference back up inside and we get rid of that smear. And not only does it recommend what the appropriate product is, but it also gives information on the bottom of thread sizes or other details, so the dealer can make sure that you have the right, uh, the right threads and the right pieces to, uh, to suit. Okay? So the database has got about 1,600 speakers in it now, and it also has uh, some algorithms in it that where it doesn't know a speaker it makes some assumptions and makes a recommendation also. Okay?